I'd like to talk about electromagnetic induction. And it's a very interesting topic. It's used in transformers, how you can plug a little black box into the wall and pick up 120 volts out of the wall and charge your cell phone at 4.5 volts or whatever voltage it uses. It's how you can charge an electric toothbrush without actually plugging it into anything. It's how you can set your iPhone onto a charging pad and you're not plugging it in, but it is still charging. It's also the principle of how uh, metal detectors work. So uh, very useful, very uh, neat topic as we proceed here. So um, we need to first remind ourselves of two right-hand rules. One right-hand rule says, okay, a charge is going to go from the positive, it's going to move toward the negative, and current is going to the right. So we would take our right hand, and because it's a positive charge, we're using our right hand. If it was a negative charge, we would use our left hand. But if the charge moves to the right, our thumb points to the right, we grab that wire, and our four fingers curl around the wire, and that would show that the magnetic field goes around this way. Our second right-hand rule says, okay, now a positive charge is moving this way. This right-hand rule predicts the direction of the magnetic field around it. But the second right-hand rule talks about what would happen when this magnetic field from our moving charge hits a second magnetic field from, say, a permanent magnet or a coil of wire or something. So if this magnetic field hits this magnetic field, the two magnetic fields are going to create a force on that charge, and this right-hand rule predicts the direction of that force. So same thing, our thumb points in the direction of conventional current, the flow of positive charge. This time our fingers are straight, and they point in the direction of the magnetic field, which goes from north to south. So we would point our fingers off this direction, and our thumb would be pointing off this direction, which would show that the force would go down. All right. Now, also a reminder that these X's represent a magnetic field going in to the screen. It's um, based on the convention of a, an arrow, where the tip of the arrow is a dot and the back of the arrow is an X. And if I had a charge that was moving to the left, we would point our thumb to the left and our fingers into the board. It would experience a force down because the palm of our hand would be pointing down. But if that charge moved through the magnetic field to the left, it would be the same effect as if this was stationary and the whole field was moving to the right. Okay, so if the whole field was moving to the right past that charge, it'd be the same thing, relatively speaking, as if this charge moved to the left through that field and it would experience a force down. And then we had these crazy ideas that if the magnetic field is increasing in strength. All these field lines are going to be getting closer together. So as these field lines get closer together, they'd be moving this way, and they'd be moving this way, and they'd be moving that way, and this way. The field lines would be moving this way past the charge, but it's like the charge is moving that way through the field. And as this field gets stronger and stronger and stronger, the charge is moving that way through the field, relatively speaking, and it would experience a force up. If the field was decreasing in strength, and like this would be like if we had a coil of wire and this is on the inside, and we turned down the, current, the voltage, so we had less current running through there, the field would get weaker. So these field lines become farther apart. And we have motion. Anytime a charge is moving relative to the field, the charge is gonna experience a force. Now, if I had a loop of wire and it goes from positive to negative, the first right-hand rule is going to say there's a magnetic field going down through the center here. And then if we switch, instead of having this be negative, this be positive, and the charge is going the opposite direction, well, in the center here, the magnetic field is going up. So just current goes one way, the field is down, current goes the other way, the field is up. 
But if we had not direct current, where the current was always going the same direction, but alternating current, the current is going back and forth, the direction of the current is constantly changing, so the direction of the magnetic field would constantly be changing. It'd be going up when it was going one way, down when the charges were going the other way. And this is a neat animation that I found, but uh, the charge is like going up and down, and this is describing the field around it. And one thing to understand is that when the charge is moving slow, there's a small magnetic field. And when the charge is going fast, the magnetic field is stronger. So right at the top, it's so I'll show it here, it's slowing down, slowing down, stop, turning around, turning around, and going faster. So when these charges are going back and forth, the magnetic field in the center is going up and down, up and down. The magnetic field on the outside is going down and up, down and up. But if we had a second coil of wire all the way around that, the charges that are in that are going to be in a changing magnetic field. And that is going to get those, it's going to put a force on those charges and they're going to get moving back and forth as well. And so this is uh, a coil of wire that goes round and round and round and round and round. And it is hooked up to 120 volts of alternating current. And when I push the button here, this is alternating current going back and forth, back and forth here. And it induces current into that um, outer coil, making the light bulb light up. That's an induction stove. So what would happen is there'd be a coil of wire. This is, so we see this is a pan cut in half and an egg not cooked and an egg that's cooked. On the glass or ceramic surface, it doesn't get hot, but the metal does. And that's because there is, under the stove, there is a coil here that has um, alternating current going back and forth, back and forth. And the pan that would be sitting on top of that would get the electrons going back and forth as well, and that heats up the pan. This is a coil of copper that's very big. And when we put this rod in the inside here and power up the current through the coil, the electrons get going back and forth so fast that uh, it makes it super, super hot, or at least the rod on the inside did. Uh, this would be used to um, heat up uh, these bolts, expand them so you can get them on, and then when they cool, they just hold on there and they don't, uh, they'll probably never come off. So this is uh, the same principle of being able to, like how I was able to light up that light bulb without actually plugging it in. This is how we can charge a phone. And those are old phones now, aren't they? Uh, Sonicare toothbrush, uh, that's not any metal connection you make in there. There's just a coil of wire on the inside and a coil of wire here. And the alternating current here will make current happen through there because of the changing magnetic field. Now, transformers, simple little thing here, but what it is doing is it's to take an input of 120 volts of alternating current and it's alternating back and forth 60 times a second, 60 hertz. And that's what you plug into here. What comes out right there is six volts of direct current. So let's see how we can take 120 volts and step it way down to only six volts. What there is, is there is, this goes into the wall, so that's 120 volts. There is a coil of wire here that is wrapped many, 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 many times. And either end of that coil is attached to those plugs that go into the wall. There is a secondary coil that is wrapped a lot fewer times. And so it's not going around and around as many times. Either end of the wire of this coil is attached to our output. And we'll try to explain it this way. We'll call this our primary coil, and it's wrapped a certain number of times, and there would be a magnetic field that's created around it, just like we had our first right-hand rule. We have this iron core that helps make the magnetic field get stronger, but then we have a secondary coil that is wrapped around the same thing. So if you power up this yellow one and have 
this magnetic field going up and down, up and down, up and down, there's going to be a, the charges that are in this coil are going to be in that changing magnetic field. So the charges in that coil are going to get more, uh, are going to get a force. But because it got wrapped more times, there's going to be more overall force on those charges, which creates a higher voltage. So, and it is directly proportional to the number of wraps. So if this blue coil is wrapped a thousand times, and this is only wrapped 100 times, if I put 10 volts of alternating current into this coil, can you guess how many volts we would get out? Well, this had 10 times as many wraps, so we should get out 10 times as many volts. That would be a step up transformer. And this was a setup I had one time that's quite frightening. You Usually, this would be a step down transformer. You would plug your power in on this side, and then it would get less voltage here. But if you reverse it, I just put 10 volts of alternating current into this coil, which means it was just a few wraps on this either end. And on this end, it was many, 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 many wraps. It took 10 volts and stepped it up to 713 volts, which is crazy. Do not touch that. You will die. And uh, same thing here. That's back to that one that created that light bulb turned on that had alternating current that went back and forth like this. And then this coil was wrapped as well. And when you push the button, it induces a voltage onto that coil because there is a changing magnetic field that's putting force on those charges. And you absolutely need a changing magnetic field to create motion in these charges. But you can do it with a with just a regular battery. And you might want to try this at home if you have an um, old charger that would plug into the wall. Tear it apart. Plug the battery into the wires that would be charging your phone. And then have that person, uh, and that would be a steady magnetic field. And our first right hand rule shows that our thumb points to the right, fingers under it are going to into the board, fingers above it are coming out of the board. And then I'm showing these X's farther apart, which means the magnetic field is weaker further away and stronger closer in. But if you just plug that battery in, that's just going to be a steady magnetic field. The charges in that other coil are not going to experience any force. But the moment you disconnect that, this field collapses. And as this field collapses, it's going to put force on all those charges because those charges were moving relative to the field. And this would be like a gigantic transformer that would step up the voltage to like 120,000 volts. And it would be used for long distance power transmission. And um, one thing about power transmission is you want it to be efficient. You don't want a lot of waste. And the way to do that is to have a very, very high voltage because power is voltage times current. And then another equation we can solve for is that power is current squared times the resistance. So if there is resistance in that wire, and there, there is, all wires have some resistance, you're going to be losing energy or per second. You're going to be losing power due to the resistance. So one way to make that the least amount of waste is to reduce the amount of current that's going through these wires. And if you had a huge voltage and a tiny amount of current, you can deliver a lot of power to a home. And if you had a tiny amount of current, you wouldn't be wasting very much power. But the power that gets delivered to the home would be the power that's produced, a very high voltage and a tiny amount of current, and the power that is wasted due to resistance is going to be minimized because you would have very little current if you had a lot of voltage. So the long distance power transmission lines are probably at 120,000 volts, but what's just in your neighborhoods comes in at around 10,000 volts. And these are transformers. You can see throughout the neighborhood if it's above ground. 
and then what comes into your home is only at a safe, relatively safe, 120 volts. Okay, so step up the voltage so we can transmit it long distances. Once it gets to our neighborhood, we step it down so it's at a safe voltage in our homes. And you have to be careful if you're working on power lines because let's say that these are uh, one set of power lines and this is a separate set of power lines. If the power through these lines go out and you're gonna get up there and work on that stuff, um, this is alternating current and there's a magnetic field around all that stuff. And um, the even if these power lines are turned on and these are off, you can still get a big charge, a big voltage on those power lines because the um, changing magnetic field around this can induce current into those. Also, if you hear the power lines humming because they're vibrating back and forth at 60 hertz, and the reason they're vibrating back and forth at 60 hertz is because the electricity that's moving back and forth, the alternating current in here, is interacting with Earth's magnetic field, putting a force on those charges, making the wire move back and forth slightly. And this is just a power switch that uh, when you turn off the power switch, uh, the voltage is so high that the electrons still want to jump across that gap, and it's pretty amazing. All right, metal detectors, there's just a coil of wire here, and when you move it back and forth, um, the the magnetic field that's created by this will induce current in metal because the electrons are free to move. And if those electrons moving in the metal now have a magnetic field, this can pick up that magnetic field and know that some metal is present. Same thing with those what's called induction coils that trigger the stoplight here. You drive over this, your, the metal in the car is free to get moving, and that metal is going to produce a magnetic field that's going to be detected by those coils. All right, Lenz's Law. So let me talk about that briefly, but um, walk through this logic here real quick. It says a changing magnetic field will put a force on nearby charges, causing them to move. Okay, that's our second right-hand rule. Now, those charges that just got moving will now have a magnetic field, and that magnetic field will always oppose the magnetic field that induced the motion in the first place. Let's wrap our brains around that one more time. If you have charges in a move changing magnetic field, those charges will experience a force, and those charges will begin to move. When those charges are moving, they now have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field of those moving charges will always oppose the magnetic field that got them moving in the first place. So how is that used? Well, there's a cool thing we could show. It's called a ring launcher. And what it does is this is a coil of wire that has alternating current on it. You put a metal ring around here. And let's explain it this way. So if you put alternating current here, just and I'm only going to show half of the cycle, just the charge moving that way. If this charge is stationary, no magnetic field around that charge. As it goes faster, the magnetic field gets stronger, so these field lines get closer in. Well, if there is a charge in this ring here, let's just show that again, the magnetic field is going that way past that charge, so it's like that charge is moving this way through the field. Using our second right-hand rule, we point our thumb toward us in the direction of that green arrow. Our four fingers point straight down due to the X's, the magnetic field, and that charge is going to get pushed where the palm of our hand faces. Well, if that charge starts to move that way, that charge is going to have a magnetic field like that. And that's described by our first right-hand rule. Well, if that charge is moving that way and it has a magnetic field like this, and it's in this magnetic field from that moving charge, those two magnetic fields are going to oppose each other, and it will get pushed. 
And what's going to happen, it's going to get pushed and that ring is going to launch up like this. And in reality, the charges are moving back and forth, but the force is always opposite on that charge, so it still get pushed. If there's a little slice in that ring and there's a charge here, nothing will happen because the charges can't move that way because there's no complete circuit. So just putting a little slice in there kills the effect because it can't, it's not a complete circuit, the charges can't move. All right, I'm almost done here. But um, eddy currents, we've always looked at charges moving through wires, and they're just moving in a line, or the wire might be in a circle, but it's always moving in that wire. But if we had charges moving along a surface, like the this uh, pollen here moving along the surface of that water, we're going to look at it as if charges are moving along a surface. And similar like with water, if the water gets pushed that way real hard, the water will actually circle back around. And we notice over here, the water is actually moving upstream. And same thing here. Those are called eddy currents when it swirls around like that. OK, here's a big metal surface in a very strong magnetic field. And we're going to take that plate and we're going to swing it through that magnetic field. We're going to swing it this way. Okay, now there are electrons that are in that thing. And we can take our second right hand rule and say red is north, blue is south. We're going to point our straight fingers into the board, going from the, the red to the blue into the board. The um, electrons, actually, we need to do this with our left hand because this was electrons, not protons. So our thumb would point to the left. And we can find that as it as though all that thing moved to the left, those charges are going to get pushed up. And they're going to swirl back around to try to fill the void. But if they're moving, they have a magnetic field. And the magnetic field of those charges are going to interact and oppose the magnetic field that got it moving in the first place. And it's going to zoom that thing down super slow. And it creates a dampening force that stops it. If we flip that thing around and have these little slits through there, it didn't do it because those slits um, cut through there. The electrons couldn't jump across that slit, so they couldn't get moving in the first place. And uh, Tower of Terror, Tower of Doom, I forget which one this is, but at six and um, at Elitch's, they drop you from the very top here, and there's these. Uh, aluminum plates here and on the chair that falls down here are very very heavy magnets and it's a magnetic force that's slowing you down so when you hit that thing there's eddy currents that go through those metal plates and they create a magnetic field that opposes the magnetic field that is on uh, the ride itself that you're falling triple beam balance here uh, if you just put a little mass there and let it uh, uh, set there. Because it's just a balance beam, it's going to teeter. It's going to go up and down for quite a period of time um, because there's very little friction. To take less time to slow it down, they have this aluminum plate in a magnetic field. And uh, that is going to dampen the motion so that it doesn't teeter back and forth for a long period of time. And then this is super cool, but this is a very powerful magnet and a copper tube. So when that magnet falls through there, the charges that are in that metal are moving relative to the field because the field is moving past them. Those charges are going to start to move through the copper. And as they move, they have a magnetic field that's going to oppose the magnetic field that got them moving in the first place. So this is just looking straight down, and we're going to drop it. And it falls very slowly through there because um, of Lenz's law. And that is it.